In August 1786, Icelanders petitioned for regular mail ship service, their right as citizens of Denmark. The ship would winter in Iceland and return to Denmark via the Faroe Islands early in the spring. One ship annually then considered good service. Throughout the 19th century, the mail ships arrived with merchant goods, news of the world, visitors and Icelanders coming home. They left with businessmen, politicians, and fortunate sons heading off to school. Schedules were published yearly in Iceland's first newspapers, Bjarki, Northern Fari, Skuld, Theodorvur, and others, often with ports of call and schedule changes if necessary. Mail ship arrivals and departures were noted in detail and by name. In the beginning, the mail ship sailed between Denmark, the Faroe Islands, and Iceland. Before 1870, Leith and Scotland had been added. These small sail and steamships were the first and only route for emigrants bound for the Americas. Urm og Wolf of Copenhagen was one of the Danish firms operating in Iceland. In 1798, they opened their first store in Eskifjörðu. In North and East Iceland, Urm og Wolf had stores in Husavik, Vopnafjörður, Eskifjörðu, and Djubovovur. In 1918, the company sold all their stores in Iceland. The company owned barks to transport merchandise for their stores. Björg, Harriet, and Hjalmar sailed to and from Copenhagen and left with emigrants from East Iceland from 1872 to 1875. Hjalmar, built in 1852, was a two-masted bark bought by Orm Ovolf in 1861. Elmer stranded in Wopnerfjörður in 1876 and was sold at auction. No information or images have been found for the Björk or Harriet. Alexander Baumgartner was a Jewish priest who visited Iceland in 1883 and wrote this in his journal. In Iceland is not one harbor pier. Ships must anchor a long way from shore. How could cargo be transferred without a pier? Salted fish, sheep, horses, and emigrants were first put in rowboats or cargo boats and then out to the ship waiting in the fjord. R&D Slyman, ironmongers, coppersmiths, ship chandlers, sheep ships, horse ships, and immigrants. Improved ships, hearths, stoves, kitchen ranges, fire irons, bedsteads, gas lanterns. They made it, they sold it, and then they shipped it. The Slyman brothers were businessmen based in Lee, Scotland. Their ships sailed with thousands of Iceland's sheep and horses and immigrants to Scotland. The sheep were bound for the butcher, the horses for the coal mines, and the emigrants for the Americas. R and D Slyman were often called sheep businessmen here in Iceland because they bought and shipped to Scotland sheep on the hoof in great numbers. Business was good, but not completely without trouble. The Comwins came here and left again with about 300 horses. Many travelers were on the ship. The ship is both large and splendid written in Theodor in 1879. But in 1883, Camus sailed into an iceberg off Hornstrandir and was much damaged. In 84, the Camus ran aground in the Orkneys. The last year of sailing to Iceland was in 1887. The next year it was sold to Italy. And the Craigforth, this ship left much to be desired. One Icelander called it a hound's hole. The ship reeked from stem to stern of horse. In 1884, the Craigforth stranded in Moray Firth in Northeast Scotland. The Copelands ran aground in fog near Stroma in Pentlands Firth on the 24th of last month. 
Passengers and crew came ashore without injury, and most of the horses were also rescued. About 100 horses drowned. And then on July 27, 1888, the Copeland slipped off into deep water and lies as shown on the map. Anchor and Allen line agents, among them Sigfus Amundsen from Wolfenfurter, booked emigrant passage from Iceland via the mail ships. Formed in 1854, the Allen Line was among the first transatlantic steamship companies to establish a network of agents and led in transporting emigrants from Norway to America. The Icelandic emigrants benefited greatly from Allen Line's experience. The contracts stated clearly in Icelandic and English the cost, departure, name of the ship, if rail passage was included, bill of fare on the steamers from Europe, and the final destination. Often an Icelandic guide accompanied the emigrants to Scotland as an interpreter. Many contracts are preserved in the National Archives in Reykjavik and can be viewed on their website. What went into the trunk? 100 pounds and 10 cubic feet. Books were treasured and many made their way westward food for five to seven days journey to Scotland, dried fish, smoked lamb, bannock, butter, skier. Farmers were advised to leave their tools, too heavy and easy to replace in America. Some had clothing, bedding, silver. Others sold all they owned to pay for passage and left with what they were wearing. Often the sheep or horses sold to pay for passage were on the same ship. The emigrants then left. Passage paid, trunks aboard, food, and some personal items at hand. Hearing of vast oceans and lands is not the same as traveling through one to another over weeks, even months. One thing to read about an iron horse and another to travel in one, breathing coal dust and smoke. Living near the sea is not the same as standing on a rolling deck. Seasickness, colds, pneumonia magnify the odors of sheep, horses, and other passengers. On the way to Scotland, the ship sailed through the Faroe Islands, sometimes a stop at Torshop or Klaxvik, on past the Orkneys to Scotland. Nearly all emigrants left Iceland on mail ships or horse ships bound for Scotland, on through the British Isles and west from Liverpool. And the ships returned to Iceland for more emigrants, sheep, and horses. R&D Slyman ships were based at the port of Leith. Brandon Harbor was also used. Sheep, horses, and emigrants left the ships. After clearing customs, Emigrants were expected to leave on the next train for Glasgow or Liverpool. One Icelander wrote that he experienced traveling through his first big city without seeing any of it. The reason for this push was due to the human flood of European emigrants passing through Great Britain's ports and rail system. No time was allowed for sightseeing. Only the very ill were detained. This old drawing of Glasgow's train and harbor area would make a fine puzzle. Rest areas were available for emigrants, but food or other services required payment. In Glasgow, during the emigration years from Norway, a Norwegian couple operated a shelter for travelers in a building now called the Sailor's Home. The Sailor's Home still stands, the tower in the center of the above photo. Icelanders bound for North America left from either Glasgow or Liverpool. Other smaller ports were also used, such as Greenock and Moville. 
often called simply Hull, this port was on the east side of England. Many ships with European emigrants docked at Hull. As with most that passed through Leith or Glasgow, the next leg was by train to Liverpool. Few Icelanders passed through Hull. Most were on their way to Utah. They first left Iceland for Denmark and from there to Hull. Liverpool's Riverside Station opened in 1895. Before that, the harbor area was far from any of Liverpool's main rail terminals. Travelers were forced to make their way through a city as large and confusing as Glasgow. Liverpool was the leading transmigration port in Europe with five times more emigrants passing through than Le Havre. Emigrant ships arrived daily, thousands cleared customs daily, and thousands boarded the next train to Liverpool. After passing inspection, emigrants often had to wait for their ship, sometimes up to two weeks. Boarding was allowed one day before departure. While they waited, the emigrants kept watch on their luggage or walked along streets near the harbor area. The ships were larger than anything most emigrants had ever seen. 90 meters, 100 meters, 130 meters, 150 meters long. Steerage room for 350, 600, 850, 900, 1,000 souls, plus often room for 250 or more first and second class passengers, not souls. Boarding, stowing luggage, nervous adults, frightened children, a noisy, chaotic melee that somehow ended with everyone on board. In the mid 1800s, the crossing was often a nightmare for steerage passengers, especially for women of any age. In the mid 1860s, Great Britain passed a law requiring improvements in sanitation and personal safety. Steerage was finally divided. Single women aft, single men fore, and families in the center. Ceiling height in steerage was two to two and a half meters. Bunks along both sides laid fore to aft. On some ships, they were thwart ships, causing much discomfort in rough seas. Only a small corridor between bunks. Each bunk was intended for three to six people, family bunks, usually double deck. Straw mattresses provided, including lice and fleas, but no bedding. Daily life consisted of various duties and routines. Passengers were usually up on deck in good weather, fresh air, and more space. Women cleaned, cooked, sewed, and cared for the sick. Men and children played games, dancing on deck on weekdays. The captain often held Sunday services on deck. Laws required enough food to be on board but it was rumored the food was nourishing enough only for passengers accustomed to animal food. Many bought extra food. A cook and proper cooking equipment was required on ships with more than 100 passengers. The minimum requirements per person per week issued at least twice weekly, two and a half pounds of bread or biscuit, one pound wheat flour, five pounds oatmeal, two pounds rice, two ounces tea, one half pound of sugar, one half pound of molasses, three liters of water daily, five pounds good potatoes to substitute for one pound oatmeal or rice. We placed ourselves in the hands of the Lord and his will, whether we should live or die wrote Borgesolem on his way from Norway to North America. Activities depended on weather conditions, but musical instruments could be put to good use when the weather was bad. 
Once a ship came into heavy fog off the coast of Newfoundland and all the instruments on board were used to make as much sound as possible so as to be heard by other ships. On the brig Incognito sailing in 1852, the story says that there were a lot of deaths and sharks were following the ship. Grieving parents had to watch the sharks attack the body of their deceased child as it entered the water. A few young Icelandic students in Denmark joined the Mormon faith and returned to Iceland in 1849. Their first converts were in the Westman Islands. In 1854, a handful of Icelanders left for Utah by way of Denmark. In January 1855, 440 Scandinavian Mormons left Copenhagen, sailed to Kingston upon Hull, took the train to Liverpool, and left on the SS James Nesmith. On February 23rd, they arrived at New Orleans after a 47 day passage. The church sought new converts and settlers in Utah and had a travel fund for the long journey to Utah. But by 1856, the fund was empty. A less expensive plan was set up. Until 1860, the route to Utah was through New Orleans and up the Mississippi River by steamboat to Nauvoo, Illinois. From there, the emigrants headed west, walking, pulling handcarts with their few belongings. Most made it, but several hundred died along the way. By 1860, rail service was available to Iowa City. In 1869, the rails were completed to the Pacific Coast and the journey to Utah was much easier. Most Icelanders who joined the church were from the Westman Islands or Southwest Iceland, about 410 total from 1854 until about 1900. We hear that some of our fellow Icelanders are thinking of moving and that 150 from Thingay or Sisla have decided to do so, not closer than south to Brazil. The first Icelander settled in Brazil in 1863. Over the next years, other Icelanders arrived. By 1873, more than 500 names were on the list as ready to leave and the Brazilian government offered free passage from Europe to Brazil. However, ships that were promised never arrived and the cost of passage to Europe was not included. In the end, less than 40 actually left. It was a six month journey, Iceland to Copenhagen to Hamburg, then from there to Brazil. Many settled in Curitiba, capital of Paraná in Southern Brazil in an area about 4,000 feet above sea level with an excellent climate for people from a northern climate. During the winter months, the St. Lawrence River was frozen and closed to seat shipping. The ports at St. John's, New Brunswick and Halifax, Nova Scotia processed immigrants to Canada and the United States. Icelanders settled in Nova Scotia in 1874 near Markland, but most had gone west by 1882. One family stayed. The St. Lawrence River is a 1,223 kilometer waterway extending from Lake Ontario to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The seaway is a canal connecting the Great Lakes of North America with the Atlantic Ocean and is maintained by both Canada and the United States. In harbors all along the St. Lawrence, custom houses provided assistance, refreshment, and rest areas for travelers. The rail trip from Montreal or Quebec City to Chicago was less than three days. At first, the Canadian railways ended at Detroit, and it wasn't until 1878 that the rail line was completed to Winnipeg. Small railroad companies stretched out along the St. Lawrence, 
Many failed due to money problems and others were absorbed when larger companies bought them. For example, Grand Trunk Railway. An early group of Icelandic immigrants made the news when they passed through Sarnia in 1875. 262 Icelandic immigrants arriving by train in Port Edward in 1875 to board the steamship Ontario en route to their new home on the shores of Lake Omanitoba. Great Lakes Steamer Service was available from Sarnia through to Chicago and Milwaukee on Lake Michigan, and also to Port Arthur, now Thunder Bay, and Duluth on Lake Superior. Icelanders heading west followed the Great Lakes route or the United States route by rail to Fargo-Moorhead, then Red River Steamboat to Winnipeg. In 1878, Winnipeg was connected to the United States railway system via Emerson, removing a serious obstacle to immigration to Canada. Transcontinental Nental rail service in the United States was completed in 1869, and the rails already covered the Northeast and Midwest like a vast spider web. In 1857, the Canadian Grand Trunk Railway advertised service to the far west and meant Chicago. The anchor and Allen Lines tickets included sea and rail service with luggage transfers. Icelanders bound for the United States often cleared customs in Canada, crossed the border, and continued west by rail instead of navigating through the busy ports on the East Coast. The Farmers Route. Most companies, including the Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Manitoba, and the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railway, elbowed for customers heading west and north. Advertisements pictured green fields and rich harvests for potential farmers hoping for free farmland in Michigan, Minnesota, the Dakotas, Manitoba, and farther west. First came the carts. The ungreased wheel sounded like an untuned violin, a sound apparently more hideous than a den of wild beasts. By mid-century, 2,500 Red River carts were screeching between Fort Gary and St. Paul, carrying furs south and supplies north. Red River Colony mail service was through St. Paul. A cart drawn by oxen, horses, or mules was the conveyance of choice between St. Paul and Selkirk. Made entirely of seasoned oak, elm, or ash, and animal hides, carts could be dismantled to float across rivers, were strong enough to carry 450 kilo, and easily repaired. Important as a half dozen axles could break in a one-way trip. The earliest immigrants would have seen and possibly used the cart to reach the Red River Valley area. The legacy of the Red River cart is still found in Winnipeg. Portage Avenue is wide because it is the original cart trail west, with carts traveling up to 20 abreast. Old cart paths became the new railway from St. Paul to St. Boniface on the Red River. Known as the Pembina Branch, it was built by the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railway. Next came the steamboats. The Red River flows north, forming the North Dakota-Minnesota border, and empties into Lake Winnipeg. It was a key route for fur traders and travelers. Steamboat and barge services thrived into the 1880s. Regular service from Fargo-Moorhead ended in 1886, but continued from Grand Forks until 1910. The first steamboat built was the Anson Northrop in 1859. The last was the Grand Forks in 1895. The Pluck and H.W. Alsop steamboats would have been familiar sites to arriving Icelanders. 
Third came the railroad. Rail service to Winnipeg was cause for celebration and had a profound effect on the settlement of the prairies. But it was the beginning of the end for steamer navigation on the Red River of the North. Yet for a long time, travel by steamer continued and rail again and finally on the water again. The Red River of the North was still the last leg of the journey for the immigrants, whether they settled in North Dakota or Winnipeg or New Iceland. By 1875, Icelanders were heading to the west shores of Lake Winnipeg. In 1877, Framfari, the first Icelandic newspaper in North America, printed a short history of the journey to New Iceland in Manitoba. From Quebec to Toronto, by rail to Sarnia, and by steamer through Lakes Huron and Superior, they gathered in Duluth on the evening of August 1st. Two days rest, then by rail to Fisher's Landing on the Red River of the North. They then boarded a steamboat and headed north, arriving in Winnipeg on August 8th. Many Icelanders found work and stayed in Winnipeg. The rest continued north to the lands offered by the government of Canada. They and their belongings were packed on large flat-bottomed boxes, flatboats often used on the Red River. Opposing winds on Lake Winnipeg delayed their arrival until August 19th and 20th. Many difficulties behind, unknown difficulties ahead. The travel-weary Icelanders who continued north on the Red River were surrounded by the great beauty of their new homeland, perhaps too weary to think of anything but the work ahead. Their children and grandchildren would certainly reap the benefits. <laughs>